Thank you so much, Afande. business hash. Abadukanya business entono eziingiza wakati wa milioni kumi ne milioni chikumu atano mwaka. Bakuanguidu wa kusasulo msolo guawe, ogua presumptive tax. Gabanyi gabanyezi, kamunye nye pili munana tano hash, banyumirue nkwale ni nyango, etali monsi indekagano. Nyango, manange biya dala. Good morning and welcome to this episode of Tax Muchuzi. This is a program where we get to... Um, discuss different tax issues. My name is Josephine Kaliasiza and I'll allow the guest to also introduce himself. Uh, my name is uh, Festo Kassidia and I'm an officer with the Domestic Taxes Department. Thank you. Very welcome Festo. Thank you. Um, this topic is a very interesting one which is a practical VAT computation and filing especially since uh, the, the traders have been up in arms and everyone is talking about FREs and VAT on every single item. So we thought that it would be a good time to talk about VAT. And so maybe we'll dive right in. What is VAT? Okay. Uh, good morning, viewers. Um, I want to take you through the... VAT and uh, value added tax and what it means and which what are the different rates and which items not all items attract VAT so uh, first of all we have to define VAT as an, an indirect tax on consumption that is charged on value added to the taxable supplies at the different stages in the chain of distribution that means that VAT is first of all a consumption you only pay VAT when you want to consume something so if you don't want to consume it, you won't pay the VAT. Mm. And then the other thing is that VAT is added to the value added. Mm. That means when you buy something and add a little profit and sell, mm. then the VAT is going to come out of the value you've added onto that price. That means uh, that you're going to also charge because you're also charged. And then the difference is what is the VAT, that is the VAT that is supposed to be remitted. So VAT is uh, mostly on services and goods that are taxable and they should be made by a taxable person. Mm -hmm. That means someone who is registered for VAT. Mm -hmm. Other than uh, VAT is charged on items other than exempt supplies and imports that are also exempt. That means that uh, VAT is charged on uh, imports that are not exempt and also supplies that are not exempt. And that means those are the standard rated supplies. Okay. So that is uh, basically what VAT is about. Okay. While well, you were describing, you used other mm. terms there, taxable yeah. supply, taxable person, exempt. So I was asking that maybe you can break it down a bit for us. All right. Yeah. Okay, Joseph. Uh, taxable supplies are goods and services made in Uganda by a taxable person. And a taxable person is someone who is required to be registered for VAT or someone who is registered for VAT. Mm -hmm. And uh, you will ask me who is someone who is required to be registered for VAT. That is uh, a, tax uh, a person who is registered for taxes and has met the threshold of 150 million in sales in a year mm -hmm. or 37.5 uh, million in a quarter. Mm -hmm. So when you make sales and uh, in three months you find that your sales are going to cross over 37.5 million, mm. that means you're required to register also in the fourth month of your supplies. Mm -hmm. So that means you've qualified to register for VAT and you're required. So a person who is already registered for VAT, is, if you make a taxable supply, that means an, uh, a, a good or service that is required to have VAT charged, Mm -hmm. then you expected to charge VAT on it. 
so that is the person required the tax rates that we have for that we have a uh, standard rated supplies mm. and those are the supplies that are charged 18 percent mm. and then we have the zero rated supplies where we charge zero percent mm. so that is not that every time you hear that we are charging there is where mm. that is zero percent and then there is where it is 18 percent and zero percent is mostly on agricultural supplies mm. and uh, medical pharmacy supplies so if you go and buy a hoe from a hardware, they mm. won't charge you that because the hoe is zero rated. Mm. And then when you go and buy bread from a supermarket, you will find that for it, it has that. So mm. they will charge you 18% okay. when you're buying. And then the other will be the exempt items. Mm. Exempt, we have also medicine. We have uh, items that are excluded from being charged that. Mm. And those are most, uh, basically like milk, Mm. and uh, it is to encourage uh, production of such items and then maybe farmers who deal in such items so that we increase the production. So some items are under exemption or they are called exempt supplies and no VAT is charged on them. Okay. So in summary, we have standard rated, which are 18%. Then we have um, zero rated, which is at 0%. Yeah. And then exempt yeah. which is also still kind of like zero percent yeah, because there's no tax on it yeah. okay um i think that makes sense so i think that clarifies where other people have been saying that vat is charged on every single item mm, that's true. so how can someone find out what is mm -hmm. supposed to be charged vat and what isn't supposed to be charged vat okay. thank you Josephine. uh when you check uh the vat act mm -hmm. Uh, you'll find that we have schedules, we have schedule 2 mm. and schedule 3. Mm. Schedule 2 is for the zero rated supplies mm. and then schedule 3 goes for the exempt supplies. Mm. So when you check under those schedules, you'll find that uh, the items have been listed mm. under those categories so that you can reference and know whether even if you're supplying an item, you're supposed to check and see, are you required to charge VAT on it? Mm. Or it is an exempt item. Mm. So most uh, taxpayers normally mistake zero rated and exempt. So you'll find that a zero rated taxpayer, when they are filing a return, they will claim their input that they incurred on other things where they were charged VAT. Mm. But an exempt, someone who is supplying exempt supplies does not claim anything because the return will not show any input that you're supposed to claim because you're dealing in exempt and so you don't need to claim any input from any purchase you incurred. So that is the difference between uh, zero rated and exempt. Mm -hmm. So that means someone who is dealing in zero rated can be able to get a refund mm -hmm. of the VAT that they paid when mm -hmm. they were purchasing. They are, you imagine you have a farm, mm -hmm. for you when you're supplying, you're supplying maybe zero rated items, but you're incurring things like electricity, mm -hmm. like water. The VAT which you incur on those expenses can be claimed from URA. Mm -hmm. and, and then the person who is dealing exempt does not claim anything. Okay. Yeah, so that okay. is the, the difference between the two. All right. So the other thing, now that we've talked about what VAT is mm -hmm. and the rates and who is eligible, okay. there's also been talk about how EFRIS is a tax. Okay. And I wanted you to clarify, on is it a tax? Some people are saying it, EFRIS is a tax because if you have EFRIS and you charge someone, they are paying 18%. So how do you say EFRIS is not a tax? So I was hoping you could make a comment on that. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, EFRIS is not a tax. That is uh, very clear. EFRIS is a system that is automated to help you know how much VAT you're supposed to charge. First of all, EFRIS has tax rates for every item. When you're configuring items into EFRIS, you will mm. find that each item already has its VAT rate configured. Mm. So IFRIS is an electronic and invoicing system that is the electronic receipting and invoicing system that was brought in by the government to assist taxpayers charge the correct tax and mm. also be able to issue invoices that can easily be recognized by everyone mm. 
mm. showing how much tax has been charged to you and uh, it will help you know which one is a genuine invoice and which one is not a genuine invoice mm. because previously the people used to issue invoices when they are not even VAT registered and they put the word tax invoice mm. but right now any freeze invoice is authenticated by showing the QR code mm. and it also shows you the FDN number and the the fiscal verification number which is supposed to help you know whether it is genuine mm. so if this is just like a vehicle that has been brought to help taxpayers correctly remit the correct taxes that means it helps taxpayers to remit the correct taxes and also know whether they are buying from genuine suppliers by giving mm. them if the receipt invoices that can easily be verified mm -hmm. using either an app or using a URA site where you can go and put in the FDN and it will print for you the if uh, the if receipt invoice again mm -hmm. the same way you were given by the supplier. So if this has just come to improve uh, the VAT chain by enabling taxpayers be able to easily file their returns when it is the system already has your details so. It is easy for you to go and pick the details that you see there and then know whether you're going to file the correct taxes. So IFRIS is there for both, it has the benefit of both the government and the taxpayer. Mm. And uh, the benefits that we can talk about for IFRIS, we have ability to validate invoices in mm. real time. Mm. That is what I've said that you can easily pick an FDN and put it in a validation box and then it will show you the same invoice with the details. Mm. That means you're able to know that this is an, a genuine invoice. Mm. And then also it, it shortens the, the audit and return examination. Previously, when we received the return as URA, we used to keep matching the supplier and the buyer. Mm. Because you have to look, Festo has bought an item from so and so and has declared. Then you try to look whether the other person has also declared Festo. So, Mm. That kind of uh, examination was shortened that now the invoice is a complete e examination of itself. It mm. clearly shows that it's Festo that has issued that invoice. Mm. And then Festo's return will also pick automatically that he made the sale to this person. So mm. it's shortened the audit and also made things easier for you right, to verify the taxpayer sales and purchases. Mm. And then uh, when you want to refund, it's very easy for you right, to verify your refund through IFRIS and then also the unfair competition from those outside the informal sector. Mm. The reason why URA is mostly in Chikubo right now is because first of all in the first phase we dealt with supermarkets. Mm. We made sure that all the supermarkets integrate their systems with the URA system that is mm. IFRIS. Mm. So now the supermarkets also complain that actually our competitors we are dealing with mm. are the Chikubo people because they almost offer the same goods and services that we offer. So we want to unify the competition mm. by ensuring that also the Chikubo traders mm. pick up the IFRIS and also issue the same way so that there is no disputed pricing and maybe uncompliance mm. that can result into unfair competition. Okay. So IFRIS has come to clearly make the ground fair for competition by ensuring that everyone is issuing invoices that are IFRIS and then they are remitting the correct taxes. Mm. So that is one of the benefits that we can pick for both the taxpayers and the government. Mm. And then also there is the improved documentation and record keeping mm. where you can't lose an IFRIS invoice. Mm. Anytime you want an IFRIS invoice, you just log into your account, you go to the report section and then you run the sales or purchases you made in whichever period, whether it's 10 years, whether it's 20 years, those records are, are, are kept properly with the URA servers and you can easily go back to them and pick whatever you want to check. And then also the other benefit that we've come that has come along with IFRIS is the pre-filled tax returns where your IFRIS information is picked automatically by the returns and your job is just to review and submit. So we are now moving away from the Excel where we had to type information. Taxpayers used to make mistakes when they are typing information in the Excel. But right now, things are picked automatically in the pre-filled return. Mm. And then the taxpayer only previews by checking the IFRIS reports and then matching them with their 
to see if the information is the same and then they submit. Mm. So it has come as uh, an easy way of filing returns and easing taxpayer compliance. Okay. So I guess I've elaborated well with the IFRS. Yeah, okay. So I can see the benefits mm. and we actually already have um, a whole lot of questions coming in. Uh, but maybe you can also break it down. Earlier, you used hard words. You know, there are some words you use configuring, which integration. Yeah, I, I was hoping you could give us um, easier ways of saying these things when I'm inputting, maybe, you know, anyway. All right. uh, but that aside, mm -hmm. when you say you went to the supermarkets, system to system, that seems complicated. Me, when I'm in Chikubo, I don't know if you've been down there, but when you're in Chicago, even us to just buy from there, the person has a shop, Festo comes, says, Jagakulaba, that thing up there. Mm -hmm. Josephine comes, I want to see something, maybe a different item. There's all that going on. I don't think the people there have the time to sit on a computer and start making that receipt. Do they have Sorry. options? that are easy, like how we have WhatsApp. You go in the app, yeah. you send your thing, and it's instant. Are there easier options for our people down in Chicago? Okay, okay. thank you, Josephine. Uh, right now, we have uh, many channels that you can use mm. to invoice through IFRS. Mm. And talking about the Chicago and the supermarket, when we compare, most of our supermarkets had billing systems. Whenever you go to a supermarket, you'd come out with a receipt. Mm. So it was easier for URA to work with the supermarkets to ensure that their systems are merged with the IFRI system so that the IFRI invoice is printed mm -hmm. by their systems without going to log on to a URA site. Mm. So when you print the supermarkets, just print the receipts and they come with the FDN. Mm -hmm. and the, So that is what we call integration, that their systems are now speaking with IFRI and they are able to print the IFRI invoice without them going to an IFRI site. Mm. So that is how easy that uh, we made work easier for the supermarkets. Mm. Now, when we talk about Chikubo, Chikubo is a bit more of informal and uh, Chikubo taxpayers, most of them are dealing in very large volumes of uh, goods. So mm. most of them are VAT registered. Mm. So as URA, we had to come up with a different channel and uh, options that uh, taxpayers can use, like the ones in Chikubo, which can ease their work. And uh, the first option we have is the EFDs, that is the electronic fiscal devices. And these were, these are the devices that you can easily charge. When you charge a device, it can last about 12 hours when it has battery. Mm. So meaning that even if you don't have power in Chikubo for the whole day, that fiscal device will be able to work for you the whole day when your shop is open. Mm. And how this device works is that it has a printer and then it can it has a screen like a, tele, like a phone, a smartphone, so it can allow you to input a transaction and issue a receipt. Mm. So remember most of the time when you go to Chikubo, people used to use calculators to calculate for you how, many, how much have you bought and then they total up and then they give you. So right now the the EFD works almost like a calculator. You're able to select the goods a, a customer has bought, mm. and then you put the quantity, and then you print a receipt for them within the same gadget. You don't need to use a printer, you need to buy a computer and a printer. So the gadget was made to ease work for both the someone in a shop, and then someone who is on a route sales. If you have trucks that go around selling, you also use the same gadget. Mm. And then the other new thing that has come up is the URA app, that mm. is the IFRIS app, mm. that has been also able to simplify because we know most right now in this current generation, almost all people have smartphones. Mm. So right now we have a smart app that has, uh, it's called an IFRIS app that mm. you can download on Android or iOS mm. and then be able to use it as an IFRIS uh, to issue your IFRIS invoices. And what I've seen taxpayers doing right now, there are thermal printers that are being sold on the market and they are not very expensive. And taxpayers are moving with uh, those thermal printers that work on Bluetooth that can communicate with your phone and then you're able to issue a free invoices using that app. Mm. 
Mm. And that app is very easy to use. It's like using WhatsApp. Mm. It is a very simplified app. You only search the item that you configured, then you put the quantity and the price. If they want to change the price that was earlier configured, you just input the price and then be able to print a receipt, maybe using a thermal printer. Mm -hmm. Thermal printers are ranging between 150,000 and 200,000. So mm -hmm. they have come to also simplify the way for traders that want that kind of flexibility. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that we had also worked on is the desktop app. Mm -hmm. that can help taxpayers work offline. A desktop app can be downloaded and installed on your computer and then it also works like the app but it can allow you to also work without internet. Mm -hmm. For it, it can allow you to generate invoices even when internet is down and then when internet comes back, it is able to upload your invoices onto the URS system mm -hmm. and you, nobody will notice that actually you didn't have internet. Mm -hmm. So the desktop app also came as the solution to simplify the challenges of the internet and any connections when the site, maybe your site is off, that app continues running for it. It can keep transactions until you gain back the stability, then it can upload your information automatically onto the URS server mm -hmm. and then your compliance will not be affected. Okay. So we've tried to come up with various solutions and more are still coming to mm. ease the life of both the Chikovo people mm. and those that are in the formal businesses. All right. All right. Okay. Um, maybe we can also go into an illustration on how that is calculated. Okay. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, I want to also use this opportunity mm. to show taxpayers how you compute VAT. Mm. Uh, we've had uh, taxpayers mostly in this current uh, strike that we are having with the URA and the traders where ta uh, the traders are saying that they are paying so many taxes mm. and URA is saying that by the way you're not the one who are paying it is the customers that you, you, you charge. Mm. So uh, we have a small computation here where we are saying that you are assuming you purchase goods of 100,000 which are VAT inclusive and you want to sell them at 110. You want to make a profit of 10,000 mm. from the goods you bought at 100,000. So we said that VAT is value added. That means the 10,000 that you've added onto the 100,000 is the value you've added. So we are assuming you went and quilivered in Chikuo, mm. like our people normally say. You went and quilivered, someone wanted shoes of 100,000. Mm. Manya, they wanted shoes at 110. Mm. But you, for you, you know a shop downtown that sells them at 100,000. Mm. So you run down and get your shoes of 100,000. Mm. And then we are assuming that your VAT registered. And you're going to charge 110 to make up a profit of that 10,000. Mm. So we are going to look at the 100,000 which you used to buy the shoes. Uh, means that you bought, uh, you, ch you were charged VAT of 15,254. Mm. Mm. that is included in the 100,000. Okay. The person down there when you're buying the shoes didn't mm. tell you that the VAT is this. They just told you it's 100,000 and they gave you an e-free invoice. Mm. And you came back with it. But that e-free invoice is showing you that you are charged 15,254 for that purchase of 100,000. Mm. So the purchase, uh, the sale which you're going to make of 110, mm. when you work out the VAT, you're going to find that the VAT is 16,780. Mm. That means it's 18% of the 110, mm. which is giving us the 16,780. Mm. So when you look at those two figures, you are charged the VAT, when you look at the purchase, you are charged the VAT of 15,254 on the 100,000. Mm. For you, you have charged 110 and you have charged VAT of 16,780. Okay. That means that uh, when it comes to you filing your taxes, mm. you're going to declare an output tax of 16,780 mm. and the uh, input of 15,254. That means the VAT you have to pay to your A is going to be 1,526. Mm. That is the value that you've added onto the purchase you made. Okay. So you find that actually in this whole transaction, the VAT which you were charged when you are purchasing is recovered when you're making a sale 
Mm. And then you don't need to give you already the whole 16,000, but you have to first offset what you incurred when you're buying. Mm. So the only difference you're going to pay you already is the 1,526, which is the profit which you made off that shoe, which is part of the profit. The 10,000 which you made has a, a, a VAT element of 1,526. So that is how small uh, this VAT is that it doesn't actually affect you as the person but the person whom you charge when you're selling is the one that ends up paying this 1226 okay. so that is how that works it is the paid by the final consumer okay so if i have jojo and daughter's business okay that means whenever i sell i've added the profit i've also counted in that yeah. i can now take away the VAT on all the things that I bought. Yes. The balance is what I send to URA. URA. Yes. On behalf of the final consumer. Yes. Um, at what is that for people who are on income tax? The ones who get to file a full return, like to include everything. I'm asking, is that for those who are able to? Because I don't know if the people on presumptive are the majority mm. in Chicago do they also get to do that uh, when you look at the VAT uh, when you look at the VAT threshold we said that uh, for VAT for you to be able to be registered for VAT mm. your threshold should have been above 150 million mm. and when you look at the presumptive uh, tax it is also saying that people who have a turnover below 150 million can file presumptive. Mm. So meaning that most of the taxpayers who are filing presumptive are not on VAT. Mm. So for them, when they are filing returns, they only, the 100, if we assume that someone who bought the shoes was a presumptive taxpayer, mm. then for them, the 100,000 which they bought the shoe is just the cost of sale that they have incurred. It is the purchase they have made mm. and the selling is the sales so the margin which they are they have to pay the 30 percent or the within the range of uh, their presumptive mm. would have been the difference of ten thousand mm. so when we go to income tax the profit which you make off the item is what you charge the tax if it is 30 percent or if it's within the presumptive rates that is what gets affected by the tax mm. but the the, the purchase itself and the sale are not, they are just an element of what constitutes the tax. Mm -hmm. So it is mostly, you are a, the tax that you are a charges is tagged to the profit mm -hmm. that you get. So it is always, you share a portion and then the government also share the portion. Okay. Mm -hmm. What I was asking is because, again, mm -hmm. one of the issues that has people up in arms is uh, multiple taxation. So some describe it that the, the same person or the same item is being added on 18% along the way. Mm. Others think that I've paid that after that you come for presumptive or for income tax. Like it's the same one person or it's the same item or it's the same show. And there are so many things. So maybe that's why I was asking. I don't yeah. know if you want to comment on that okay. further. Okay, uh, if you're a presumptive taxpayer, it means that you're going to be the final consumer in terms of VAT mm. because you're not registered for VAT to charge VAT and pass it on to them. So that means the price which you charge me is going to be inclusive VAT, but me and you know that for you, where you paid, if you imported goods mm. and you paid VAT at customs mm. and withholding tax and the other taxes, the VAT which you charged, since you're not VAT registered, which was charged to you, you won't be able to claim it because you have no other return to file mm. in terms of VAT. Mm. So meaning that the cost which you incurred when you're importing the goods is going to be the one you're going to base on to determine your selling prices. Mm -hmm. And so meaning that the VAT will be within the costs that you incurred, mm. but it won't be able to be passed down to the final. You won't be able to know whether you're passing on a tax because it's like both of us have, have paid the tax. Yeah. So for you, you're going to charge me based on the cost that you incurred, and then you're not going to add any other tax. 
but to only charge me to get your profit. Mm. So there is no multiple uh, taxes that are being paid. It's just that when you bought the goods, you have to count that that tax is inclusive of the purchase costs that mm. you incurred because you're not VAT registered. Okay. So meaning that for you, when you're computing your selling prices, the VAT is going to be part of your purchase costs. So there is no multiple charges because you're not going to charge anyone, but you're going to charge what will bring back your profit margin and what you use to purchase the item. Okay. So that is how VAT works. That you, If you're not within the chain of VAT, then you're going to become like the final consumer. But even you, because you're going to charge a profit, because nobody works and doesn't charge a profit, mm. meaning that for you, you're going to pick whatever taxes you are charged and then they will become part of your costs. Mm. And then you will embed them and the, add the profit margin and then charge the customer. Okay. So the tax bit is not, it's not, there is no double taxation within that chain. Okay. Mm. Um, all right. Then maybe you can also give us a practical illustration okay. of um, how to fail the how return. The return. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Josephine. I want to first give a background because mm. right now we know that there is a preferred return. Mm that has come and it's coming from uh, still uh, you are listening to the taxpayers complain mm. and trying to find a solution that can ease their compliance. Mm -hmm. So one of the cases that we have is that uh, the pains that we are being experienced with the odd returns is that they, they have too many validation points. Mm. You try to file a return and it is always trying to validate whatever you put in to mm. see if it is correct. Then uh, the MS Excel template, we are complex to use. Some taxpayers used to have all the Excel. You find that the Excel of URA doesn't is not compatible with your Excel. Mm. So you find that you have to use another computer to file. So the MS Excel have now right now been eliminated. Mm. And then uh, filing a return using a current template had been uh, tedious. That is the MS Excel mm. and time consuming. And also the duplication when IFRIS came, taxpayers now we are required to go and generate reports from IFRIS, then come back and feed them into the Excel template. So mm. we saw there was duplication of work. So this has also been eliminated okay. by ensuring that the IFRIS information goes direct to the return so mm. that you don't need to feed it manual and then end up making mistakes. Mm. So all those pains we are listening to. And right now we are moving away from the MS Excel template, that is uh, the Microsoft Excel to a web-based return and this was effective November 2023. Okay. So even your ASCUDA information, that means when you import goods and you incur VAT, mm. uh, this VAT is picked automatically by the return and it is put within your section of the, uh, the, the import and mm. that VAT will be reflected as your input. Okay. So uh, the changes that have been made also affected the ledger. Mm. That means previously, when you had an offset in the previous period, there was a box that was called offset carried forward, mm. where taxpayers were required to put a, a, a figure from your previous return. That time, sometimes you find taxpayers who have assessments against their returns complaining the offset has refused because there is no, uh, an assessment mm. that was passed on your return. So the offset refuses because it was amended and you're not aware of which figure became because you're not the one who did the assessment. So mm. right now the offset has been carried forward to your ledger and you can easily use it to reduce your tax position when you're going to pay. And also uh, credit transfers. If you have a VAT that was uh, deducted from you and you want to use those credits, mm. they are also now available in the new pre-field return. You mm. just select which ones you want to utilize and you'll be able to utilize them. So those are the benefits that have come along. So the schedules that we used to fill schedules and you had to make sure that the figures have matched if free. And so those schedules are going. Taxpayers used to waste a lot of time trying to match the information with if free. Mm. And so the schedules have also been eliminated. So let's go to the practical. Mm. Uh, we we're filing a new return. All right, so we are going to try here an example of a return. So the new site is also on for URA. It's no longer the old site, so it looks like this. So you go to the login section, then you go under your portal account. And so you'll get an interface which requires you to log in your TIN and a password. 
and then you'll put in a QR code that has to match. So you'll have there the capture that has to match what you, has been displayed. And then uh, we'll proceed to the new. So right now, when you open into your account, you have a prompt that is prompting you to update your business registration number with URSB. If your registration number is not up to date, like the one you're seeing here, it is up to date. That's why there is this digit. It has to start with 800. So if you find that you still have the old number, then you'll be required to update so that we have the correct update from URSB. Okay. So you need to click on update once you have the correct, you have inserted the correct, then you click on update and then the system will update and you will continue. Mm. And then also there's this prompt requiring you to, whether you have any new changes, you can make amendments to your team if you have anything you want. So okay. right now we shall skip that. So we are looking for return. When you log into your TIN account, it is going to look like this with the various menus. And right now we are going for return filing. So we'll go under return mm. and then we look for value added tax, which is the VAT return. Okay. So when you select it, uh, it's going to bring you a date selection where you're required to pick the month you're going to file. Mm. And uh, for our interest, uh, let's, uh, I'm going to select uh, uh, last month, a March. previous month. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see if I didn't file March. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to select March. And when you select, you're going to be required either to click on view return or submit return. Okay. So when you click on, uh, if you're going to make any changes to this return, you're required to submit, uh, to click on submit return immediately mm -hmm. at the beginning. Okay. So that you're able to make some changes to your return. When you are in the view return, mm -hmm. you won't be able, some boxes like addition of cells here mm -hmm. will not be allowing you to add cells. Okay. So it is always better, even if you click on submit the return, the mm -hmm. return will not submit itself. Mm -hmm. But it will allow you to uh, to have flexibility in making changes to your return. Okay. So that is the benefit of clicking submit return. So when we come, when the return opens, uh, the first section you're going to look at is the tax computation summary, mm -hmm. which is showing you how your output VAT for the period and the input have been computed. Mm -hmm. So you'll be required to click on this plus sign to show you the adjustments that are, are under your output tax mm. and then uh, when we run through this you'll find that under total output VAT for the period mm. uh, you have additions that need you to make changes so here we have payments received for standard rated supplies made on cash basis other than to government for previous period mm. uh, this section is for those that are on cash basis you know that if you want to file on cash basis where you only pay taxes when you're paid and you also claim taxes when you, you pay for your purchases, that means you're on cash basis. And cash basis is for taxpayers that are under 500 million. If your turnover is below 500 million, you can, ask, uh, you can write to URA commissioner and request to file on cash basis so that you only pay on cash. That mm. means you pay your taxes based on cash. Mm. When you're paid, that's when you also pay your VAT. And when you pay for your purchases, that's when you'll also be able to claim your VAT. Mm. So that is the, the cash basis. And this adjustment is for you. So this adjustment is meant for you to input. You are assuming right now we are in the area of IFRIS. Mm. IFRIS is based on invoice basis. When you invoice, the system will pick that you've made a sale. Mm. But uh, remember that if you find yourself that you're on cash basis, that means you will be you will not be able to you will not be able to refuse the return from uh, showing the VAT that you charge to the client mm. when you are invoicing. So you will make your adjustments to output by putting in a figure here of the amount that was billed on cash basis. Okay. So this is where you make the changes so that they change from the figures that you had in your sales. We are, mm. going, we are going to come and look at the sales section mm. and then we can come back to the tax computation. Mm. So I think uh, 
let me let me start from the cell side because these are adjustments to what is coming from the schedules okay all right so let's first check our cells this is the schedule that is looking at the cells which you made in the period mm. we see that here we have uh, cells that we are made as local exempt mm. and then uh, this uh, there is local zero rated these are the zero rated supplies that you made locally in uganda mm. then exports zero rated these are the exports that all exports are zero rated so uh the zero rated here is picked if you invoiced and you showed that this was a zero rated supply mm. and it you you just show that it is an export then the system will automatically pick it as zero rated so these figures are coming from your ifris account mm. and this is how you invoice your items local standard rated is for the standard rated items that you supplied here in uganda then local standard rated government supplies these are supplies or invoices that you generate to government agencies or ministries mm. and you indicate when you're invoicing in ifris you select a uh, government mm. under buyer type mm. so the system will allow you to invoice under government okay. and the benefit it has it that it can allow you to supply government on cash basis mm. that means we only you'll be able to pay the vat when government has paid for your invoices okay. that is the benefit of invoicing under government when you select buyer type government okay and then uh, local deemed is where you have a deemed project that you're supplying this is where you select and then out of scope supplies these are supplies that are not catered for under vat and this section was put there to cater for such mm. and it has to be picked from ifris right now it is going to cater for reimbursement that we are not previously catered for mm. under VAT. Reimbursements are so much in IFRIS. Mm. And uh, right now we didn't have how to treat them, but now they are going to be catered for under out of scope. Okay, what do reimbursements mean? Like um, something has gone out the night? Yeah, uh, reimbursement, mostly we are seeing reimbursement under clearing firms. Okay. Where a clearing agent is going to incur an expense on behalf of the client mm. because where you are maybe the client cannot like you're in kenya and the client is based in uganda and they cannot be able to pay for that expense within kenya mm. the clearing agent who has gone to clear the goods of the client is going to incur an expense mm. on behalf of the client mm. and then when they come back to make the air if voice okay they have a section called reimbursement where they are able to claim that money from the client but there is no element of value added mm. it is just a clearing agent getting back the money they incurred on behalf of the client so that is out of scope because mm. it's not affected by the tax okay you're just getting money that you clearly uh, incurred on behalf of your client mm. so that is what we call out of scope supplies okay all right so this section that was put there for additional cells is for any cells that you make outside ifris if you find that maybe you didn't have internet or you find yourself unable to invoice but the transaction has been picked in that period then you're required to indicate your figures here and uh, let's assume that we are going to add uh, four million that you sold outside ifris under standard rated supply so this figure will come here to cater for anything that you left out from ifris since we are saying that these figures are being picked automatically from IFRIS. Mm. So those are cells that you will add in. And then uh, when you go to purchases, uh, we have uh, uh, we have purchases. We also have the same schedule like we've seen. We have local exempt. If you incur any uh, purchases that are exempt, they will be picked here. If mm. someone invoice to with IFRIS. Mm. And then uh, imports are uh, exempt. If you have any exempted imports, they will be picked there. Then uh, local zero rated. If you incur any zero rated, like we've said, hose and those agriculture mm. that are zero rated, they will, the figure will come here. And then for imports zero rated, the figure will come here. Then local standard rated, the figure is picked here for the purchases which you buy that are standard rated. And then imports and are uh, deemed and the other deferred import standard rated deferred mm. so all these are picked from ifris and then they will normally have instances where you can receive an invoice in your ifris account when you don't know where it has come from you've never mm. transacted with someone mm. but then you find you're getting an ifris invoice mm. 
If you find that you don't agree with that first invoice, you're required to put that under disputed. So let's assume out of the 30 million that mm. you've received, you're disputing 5 million mm. as not have been your purchase. It is not something that you knew where it came from. Okay. So when you put in the 5 million and dispute it, the amount is going to change from being 30 million to 25 million. And that means the VAT which you're going to claim will not include the VAT which you've disputed. Okay. Uh, this helps you not to claim VAT that will bring you issues when you are asking you, what happened to the purchases you made that you didn't sell. Mm. If you receive an invoice accidental and you don't agree with it, you can come and dispute it from this box. Okay, I just wanted to ask about um, deferred imports. Okay. I think standard rate are deferred. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, uh, then uh, when we look at uh, standard rate deferred, uh, when you make, uh, there is a facility called deferred uh, default tax facility mm. which is available under customs yeah. uh, normally uh, industries like those investors that are bringing in machinery or mm. it's a, an uh, you find a manufacturer mm. want to bring in a, a machinery you are allowed to bring in that machinery and you don't pay VAT at okay. customs okay. but that VAT is deferred that means it is uh, pushed onto when you will use that machinery okay and uh, normally that deferred VAT is not paid if that machinery is put to the proper use on which you wanted it to to be put but mm. if you sell the machine instead of using it for manufacturing mm. then you will be required to pay the VAT okay. after so deferred means that government has deferred you from paying the tax maybe you pay them in future when but also that future money. depends on whether the, uh, the item which you have brought in is you put to proper use of how you described it at customs. Okay. So that is the deferred bit. Okay, so I guess that's one of, uh, should I call it the good things that maybe the taxman extends mm. to a person. Uh, so yeah. that when, I'm, when I buy the machine, before I use it, you can't expect me to pay because I have not earned yes. Uh, yes. from using the machine. Yeah, very true. Okay. All right. The other thing that I'd uh, left out is that taxpayers have been calling me, asking me about uh, purchases that they make from people that are not on IFRIS and they, those goods are not captured on, uh, on IFRIS. Mm. When you buy things outside on someone who is not registered for IFRIS, you'll be required to put it under out of scope purchases. Okay. And this is catering for anything, uh, normally like the restaurants, you mm. find that you're in a castello market buying matoke, onions. Yes. Those purchases, since they will be required for uh, you to declare them in income tax, you're also required to come and match them with your VAT so that you're not queried for things that were not declared in your VAT. So you're required to come and input the figure in this box so that it picks this purchase, even though it doesn't have VAT on it, but it is required that you declare it for income tax purposes. Mm. So this is the box that has been put there to cater for all those purchases that are made outside IFRIS. So this, to this will be our total purchases according to this schedule. Then we can proceed to input tax allowed. Mm. And this section is catering for anyone who has a uh, apportionment. Okay. You will ask me maybe what a standard alternative method is yeah. and what a normal method is. Yeah. So if you find that in your cells, you normally have both exempt and uh, you find you have exempt, you have standard rated, zero rated. Mm. If you find yourself with any exempt cell, you'll be required to apportion your input. You'll not be able to claim all the input you have incurred on your purchases. Okay. So that means you'll be required to apportion the input according to the sales ratio of uh, standard rated over the total sales times your input mm. that means your input is going to be based on vertebral supplies okay uh, so if you incur the right now if you look at this client there is a vat of uh, 4.5 4 million mm. that they incurred in this period mm. but when it comes to apportionment you find that only 1.8 million is going to be allowed to be claimed for that purposes Okay. And this is because we have apportioned and seen that when you come back to their cells, you will find that their exempt are taking a big portion mm -hmm. compared it to their zero rated and standard rated. So this taxpayer's input cannot be claimed all of uh, as a whole, mm -hmm. but they have okay. to 
a portion uh sum that is going to be attributed to the exempt supplies mm. so this is how it works so you can imagine that maybe you're dealing in the different items some are exempt some are standard rated some are zero rated but then we look at items like rent like water where you won't be in a position to tell me that this exact ex, this exact expense i incurred it and it is attributable to this supply which is exempt or standard rated mm. so that's why we have that normal me method where your the system will automatically give you input based on the ratio of your cells and then it will depend on uh, the rates that you, your, your, your cells have mm. and then uh, the standard alternative is the method which allows you if you click on the standard alternative this mm. box here opens up this mm. box was not open at normal because it is using a fraction okay. normal automatically just uses a, a, a fraction of your variable supplies over your total supplies mm. and then when we come to standard alternative it assumes that you can be in position to determine your input that is attributable directly attributable to taxable supplies mm -hmm. and you can be able to defend it in this box mm -hmm. that means out of the 4.5 million if we are able to justify that 3 million we can clearly indicate that this 3 million is only for the taxable supplies yes. that we made the sales that we made that were in taxable mm. that means we can be able to put this and it will it will be picked as as per our computation not as per the fraction that the system computes okay so what does defend mean in this case do i have to have evidence that shows that these expenses were directly as yes. a taxpayer yes as a taxpayer you'll be required the law says that you'll be required to keep proper records that clearly show the taxman that these expenses were properly uh, like were clearly directly generated when you are trying to generate sales for taxable supplies okay. that means those, that VAT was incurred when you are you imagine you're dealing in solar products and then you have solar and then some of the components are vertible and some are not when I go and buy the other items that are vertible they will be charged VAT and then when I buy solar, I'm not going to be charged value because it is exempt. So what happens is that since I'm able to clearly know that these goods for them I was charged VAT, I will be able to come in this box and put the VAT element of this item and say this one I clearly know that the sales you're seeing in the box of uh, standard rated was incurred by this VAT that is I'm um, sold out. So let me claim all my vat as i was charged so that is what it uh, it means for defending it has to be clear to the taxman that this vat is clearly for the goods that were vatable yes so i can proceed all right so when we see this person who has apportioned we find that their vat has moved from the 1.8 million to 3.6 and uh, this is what they uh, they want to claim according to then this other section is for withholding tax credits that you have if you have anyone who withheld VAT from you you can input it here but this is clearly for informational purposes because right now as far as this new return is concerned the VAT which you're withheld from goes directly to your ledger and you can easily claim it when we come to this section of tax summary you'll be able to click here and you'll find those credits there and your job is just to tick and say let me take off this and take off maybe this to clear my liability so the credits already have uh, are located to your ledger and you can be able to claim them when you're filing the return so you don't need to this section is there for informational purposes but it is, does not reduce your tax that you're going to pay because it might find that you might find that the time you file this return the person who withheld from you has not yet filed the return so that they declare you and you're able to claim the vat that you had so that is the difference so the last section is the tax summary which displays how the taxes have been broken up but let me go back to the tax computation because the taxpayers normally ask the figures that come here they wonder where they come from all right so let's just run through the output section adjustments we have uh, here we said this is for someone who is on cash basis 
Then here we have payments received for standard rated supplies made to government for previous period. So right now we said that in this new regime, a, a, a taxpayer can be allowed to supply government and doesn't pay that VAT immediately. But you will pay the VAT when you're paid, when government sends you money and you see they have paid your invoice, you come back in this box and you declare that by the way, I supplied the government and they have paid me, so I've received 5 million from a previous invoice that are declared as cash. So let's assume government has given us 50 million from an invoice that was earlier declared as a cash basis invoice. So this is where you're able to come back and declare the VAT that you had charged government. Okay, so that is the section. Then here, the next section is for approved credit notes received for buyer. So if you have any invoice that you claimed on earlier, in the earlier periods, all in this current period, and then it is cancelled by a credit note, the credit note will come in this section to reverse the input which you had earlier claimed. So this is the input that was earlier claimed by the buyer. And then VAT inferred at, depo at importation will be indicated here. And then we have tax charge due to credit memos. Our credit memos are rebates that uh, people get. We have normally taxpayers that deal with big companies like Bidico, like Unilever, where they have target to sell and then they are given an incentive for the target that they have sold. So uh, such taxpayers normally find themselves receiving credit memos which are indicating that they have been able to, they have got uh, maybe uh, uh, an incentive or they normally call themselves commissions or rebates. Sometimes you can find that when you sell two jerry, uh, 10 jerrycans, you're given two jerrycans free. So these are catered for under this box and uh, system we want to. All right, so they are catered for under this box. If you receive anything uh, as an incentive from your supplier. Then change in accounting method. This was a quotation in January where uh, you already had invoked this section. It was section 28 subsection 4 where any taxpayer who allocates under standard D, well, if you go there where we have been, where you apportion your input, this section was to unify whatever input you had overclaimed and either put a charge or a credit. So if you find that under your apportionment you had overclaimed taxes, this will, in every January, you find that this box will come back with a figure of the tax that you're supposed to pay because you overclaimed when you went into the apportionment method. Then uh, tax due to bad debts recovered, the box is there. And then uh, the other adjustments that I can talk about are the ones under input. When you click this box, uh, this plus here, you find the tax charged due to credit notes. When you cancel your sale, the input will be given back to you. Uh, even if you made a sale but you cancel it, it will come back as an input and then it is under this box. Then we have tax credit due to issued credit memos. And uh, this is also coming from issued credit memos for a seller. This reduces the, uh, the, this increases the input of the seller because they have issued out a credit memo to their buyers. Then we have also tax credit due to end of year input. So if you over, if you over, if you find that you overpaid the taxes and the end of year comes for apportionment, you find that you get a credit and your input will be increased by the apportionment. So, and then we hear the last, we shall get the total input tax credit allowed for the period, which is a, a subtraction of your total output minus your total input after all the adjustments and then we get the tax to be paid for the period. The other section that is down here is for imported services. If you have any imported services, they'll be captured here. And if you have any imported services that you forgot to invoice under IFRIS, you can put them under this additional column. So this is the, the new return and it has come to simplify your returns that are, have been being done through the Excel, but right now they are web-based. You don't need to download anything. Everything is done on these pages without downloading or uploading anything. All right, thank you, Jesse. Thank you so much. I think now we can get into the questions. Okay. I have one from Farouk Suleiman, who's watching on YouTube, who's saying um, he bought a hole okay. at a hardware 
and was asked for an e and was asked for an e receipt okay so uh, maybe you can comment on that or advise him on what he can do because in your example since hoes are for agricultural purposes mm. they should be exempt mm, zero rated, actually. yeah so sorry zero rated mm. so um maybe you can advise Farouk on that okay uh what i wanted to get clear is uh is it Farouk was asked for uh, Farouk is the seller Farouk is the one who bought the, one the who buyer bought. Yeah. from the hardware okay but then he was also asked for an e receipt i don't know if Farouk is still watching and can offer us more details okay but uh what i can maybe tell Farouk is that uh when you're sold uh, a hole even though it is uh it is zero rated uh, you're supposed to get an e-freeze invoice indicating that the whole is zero rated. So buying an item that has not attracted a tax does not mean that that item should not be invoiced free freeze. Okay. Yeah, so all sales that a taxpayer who is registered for VAT and is on e-freeze should each give you an e-freeze invoice. Even if you're buying milk, even if you're buying horse or anything that doesn't attract tax because that is the only way you know that clearly that this whole is costed you this much and maybe no tax has been paid because it is under the correct category. So that is what I would advise for all. So they should still get the receipt? Yes. Whether for them as an individual to have proof of their transaction? Yes. Or if they want to put it in the system because I noticed that where there are zero rated supplies, mm -hmm. it still helps with the apportionment, right? Yes. As well as claiming. Um, okay, then we have um, Farouk again. Uh, another question you need VAT on BASOP, which is 5,000 shillings. Mm. So, when I charge the final consumer 18%, um, that means they'll buy that bar at 15,000. Okay, I don't understand. It said but... he's uh, buying soap, yeah, he bought Maybe soap at how much? 5,000. 5,000. So they are now adding 18%. And he has to add 18% and sell it at how much? He's saying that that means the final consumer will buy that bar at 15. Okay, so Farouk, uh, let's assume that uh, you made a purchase of soap at 5,000 and you want to sell it at uh, 18,000. If we look at these two items, they fifteen, fifteen at fifteen thousand. Mm -hmm. So we are saying that you bought soap at five thousand and you are charged the VAT. If we look at the VAT that was charged to you, we shall compute eighteen over one one eight times the five thousand. And uh, the VAT which we expect to have paid here when you are buying the soap is going to be the 18 over 118 times the 5,000, which is about 7, 000, uh, 763 shillings. Okay. So the 763 shillings, then for you, you came and uh, you also sold it at 15,000. That means that the 18 over 118 times the 15,000 is going to be Okay, so uh, uh, Farouk, if we are to look at this uh, this transaction, the purchase which you made for the soap, you are charged 763 shillings. That means that if you're going to sell this soap, you're going to just add a smaller margin to it, and then you'll find that the VAT which you have to charge the taxpayer, or manya, the VAT which you're going to charge the final consumer is not going to be it's going to be slightly above 700 shillings because for you are charged 700 but it's going to depend on the markup which you add on to the 5000 to derive the final vat that you're going to charge the, the customer so meaning that if you charge the customer 15000 
the VAT is 2,288. But if we assume that this soap was bought at 5,000 and you sell it at 7,000, which is ideal, maybe you want to make a profit of about 2,000, that means the VAT which you're going to charge the customer is going to be the 18 over 118 times 7,000, which is about 1,068. So that means that uh, actually the charge which is going to determine the VAT you're going to charge the customer is going to depend on how much profit you add to that purchase that you made for you to drive the VAT. Otherwise, the VAT does not increase the item's price, but it is going to depend on how much profit you want to add in into the item. And then that is also the VAT, the VAT element is going to, uh, to relate to whatever profit you add in and the final price you're going to charge the customer. So that is how the VAT works. It is based on the how much you add in as the value added that will determine the final price of uh, and the final price and then the VAT element of the price. Okay. So I think what Farouk was saying, I think he assumed that when he buys at five thousand, VAT makes the, the item fifteen. The item fifteen, yeah. but that's not the case. Yeah. That depends on the markup as a trader mm, that that, the, that you're adding. Uh, yes. So I think most times I've been buying a bat around 7,500, right? Which yeah. 7,000, 7,500, 6,500, depending. Mm. So you just take off that 18 yeah. and you're able to deduct the 18 that you are charged as a trader. Yeah. It is actually the final consumer, the one who buys it last, me who's going to wash my clothes, the last person to buy it. I'm the one who pays 18% and I can't deduct it. Whereas the traders... Mm -hmm. can deduct mm -hmm. the same amount. Mm -hmm. So Farouk is saying again that if this is a system which helps you to collect more taxes in terms of penalties, do you have a comment? Okay, uh, Farouk, I think is uh, referencing to the current enforcement. Uh, Farouk, thank you so much for the questions. Uh, currently, uh, the penalties that are being issued are based on Section 73 to be, and uh, they are in the TPC. But uh, the penalties actually are not revenue that you already would have wanted to collect if all taxpayers were compliant. The penalty element is coming because of tax fa uh, taxpayers failing to become compliant. So it is just a punitive. We are saying that as we implement IFRIS, we are doing both carrot and stick. Mm. The carrot is the fact that we are trying to come up with various channels that can ease the issuance of invoices. But then those taxpayers who have been persistently engaged and given the alternatives and they refuse to adopt, those are the ones that are being penalized the six million. But you already doesn't go out to collect revenue in terms of penalties, but we use penalties to change the behavior of a taxpayer that has failed to be compliant. So that is how uh, the penalties are coming. Otherwise, we are not target we don't have targets to collect penalties the target sure. is to onboard taxpayers onto ifris mm. that is how uh, it, it, we are doing the whole ifris implementation okay so basically if you're doing the right thing then you shouldn't be worried about the penalties uh, yes if you're issuing that the, the receipts answer, as yes, you should yes so would like to ask him why again stretching me to file returns when you have ifris Okay, I think this has been answered. With EFRIS, the information is automatically populated into the return. Yes, with the exception of a few edits. Uh, yes. Okay. So I think Farouk is saying, why don't, why doesn't the return file itself automatically so mm. that it doesn't have to? The reason why the return was not made automatic is because you still have those changes. Like I said, you will find that you have received an invoice of EFRIS. Mm -hmm. but you're not aware about the transaction. Mm -hmm. So you won't, uh, if the system files automatically and it picks that invoice and takes it into your return, you are, will require you to account for the sales of a purchase which you're not aware about. Mm -hmm. So the edits which we require you to make are for you to ensure that the return you're going to give us is correct according to what happened in your business. Okay. And then also if you have any sales that you made outside IFRIS that you'd want to account for, Mm. so that you're not penalized for under declaration, 
Mm. Then you just add in those cells and then click submit. Then the return will proceed to be submitted. Okay. So that is how the prefilled return works. Someone is asking or compare asking you mm. the similarities or lack thereof between Efris and QuickBooks. Okay. All right. Uh Ifris, uh, Ifris is the, an invoicing solution, invoicing and receipting solution that helps us to generate e-invoices that are for basically the first people that we are gazetted to issue Ifris invoices are the VAT registered taxpayers. And then when we look at their QuickBooks accounting, QuickBooks is a software for accounting that enables you to generate transactions and financial statements. So when we look at QuickBooks, QuickBooks is a software that is for accounting purposes. Accounting will mean uh, it will account for your sales, your purchases, your assets, your balance sheets, like it comes a lot with more of the accounting bit. Yet IFRIS as a solution was brought in as an invoicing solution to account for VAT. So that means that IFRIS does not replace the accounting systems, but it helps to clearly uh, align the purchases and the sales of the taxpayer so that they, they are able to file the correct VAT first of all and then also to ensure that they, their purchases and sales align with their accounting side. Uh, we advise taxpayers to integrate their accounting systems with IFRI so that whatever, the, I, uh, whatever information is being generated by the accounting system is automatically picked by IFRI. But IFRIS will only pick the component of the sales and purchases. It will not go into your balance sheets, into your assets. But just for uh, posting transactions into the URS server for the IFRIS side, and then you're able to generate physical invoices. So that is the difference, that the other one is an accounting solution, and IFRIS is basically an invoicing solution. Okay. All right. Um... Achan Brendan Okulo. I think our taxpayers don't have time to read the act, so they end up hiring tax agents who charge them high fees. URA should regulate tax agent fees or filing returns, tax agent fees for filing returns and offering advice to taxpayers, and perhaps work on the timeline to solve taxpayer issues, especially on credit notes approval. Mm -hmm. Do you That's have? Uh, comment on that mm. and maybe by extension can if someone wanted help can they come or the, it has to only be a tax agent or can I come if I want to learn how to use the system can I approach your or do I have to pay some fees okay. thank you yeah. all right uh thank you so much uh uh the viewer who has commented on that uh when it comes to agents and uh, return filing Right now, whatever you are is doing is to simplify the return so that any taxpayer who has any basic education can be able to file their returns by not needing the services of a tax agent. That's why all the information is now fed automatically so that someone just goes there and submits the return. But uh, in case uh, a taxpayer wants to have the basic knowledge of filing a return, they can come to any URS center and then ask uh, for that help and then you'll be given uh, you'll be given time to go through how to file a return and you'll work out when you know how to file your return so you cannot regulate the fees of agents but at least you can facilitate the taxpayer to be able to file their own returns okay thank you the one of credit notes that one uh, credit notes are managed by the by the tax stations and uh, we are trying so much to make sure that the turnaround time is improved. Right now, approving credit notes is one of the KPIs of the officers and uh, the URA staff. So they are trying to do their best to make sure that uh, these credit notes are approved in time. Okay. Then there's one from Shaman Twaha on X. Um, he's saying, you say VAT is an indirect tax, but you want to collect it directly. If an importer paid it, when importing the supplies, why then come to collect it off the sales of the same supplies? Nzeno ntesa, kanamanyi mwandi gata dewali kubintu nga biyingida, au vieti ajakubad indirect ebyadala. 
So he's saying that the effort that's being put on this side where people are selling mm -hmm. should be put mm. when someone is importing. Importing the goods, yeah. Because then it will be indirect, truly. Yeah. So maybe you should comment on that. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Sharon. Shaman. Uh, Shaman. Mm. Shaman. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, Shaman. Uh, when it comes to VAT, we said that the VAT is a value-added tax and it is applied at every chain of the supply. Mm. VAT, we are not, uh, URA is, or oh, Uganda is not the only country that has been, that has collect, been collecting tax mm. or based on VAT. So we say that VAT is paid by a final consumer and we are saying that the person who imports the goods is the, the, the supplier who is trying to make the goods come in because at, at, at the beginning when the goods are coming in into the country uh, we find that uh, you're either importing in and then some goods are being manufactured here mm. so we know that our economy has both the manufacturers that are manufacturing the goods mm. and also have alternatives of going out mm -hmm. and then importing the goods mm. and an item which is standard rated here in Uganda is standard rated at customs when you're importing the good. Mm. So the VAT which is being collected at customs is the same VAT which the same which also the manufacturer in Uganda mm. is going to charge when he's giving the goods to the trader. So the customs collections that are being made at the at the point of import is for just the it is to charge you for the same part which the manufacturer who should have manufactured the good here also charges the same so it is that is just to unify the bit of the import and the manufacturing okay because both have to pay the the tax at that point they have to charge the tax at that point so mm -hmm. at the customs entry it's like it's your which is collecting directly but at the uh, manufacturer in Uganda, the manufacturer collects on behalf of URA. Okay. So it is the, there is no other tax that we charge there. And since that is collected that by is paid by the final consumer, the trader who charges for the item when they are selling it out also has to collect the VAT that is going to offset what VAT they paid at customs. Because a trader paying VAT and they don't charge it at the selling point, that means it is the trader who has incurred the VAT, yet they have to pass it on to the final consumer. So that is the reason why VAT has to continue up to the point of the person who buys the item last. So we can't have VAT at, uh, we can't eliminate VAT at import because the trade the manufacturers here will be disadvantaged mm. because for them they have to charge mm. so that's the reason why customs has to collect and then also here we have to collect within the economy within uh, the, the economy and then within the trade as it happens okay. so that is the reason why that is okay. how it is but i also think it's indirect in the sense that me who <laughs> as a final consumer who pays mm. who actually pays the, the tax yeah uh, or who bears the burden of that, who feels the pinch or bears that burden of the tax. Mm. I don't pay directly to her. Yes. It is collected it is indirectly collected. from yeah. me yes. by the traders by the trader. who also, but it's a whole chain, yeah, basically. Whole chain and so from either right. import or manufacturing, everyone mm. keeps adding, yeah. Yeah. but they get to subtract, which I, as a final consumer, mm. don't exactly. get to do. Yes. So that's... That and that, also that's when, they are, when someone is telling you my item is at 5,000, they won't mm. tell you the VAT element. Mm. So you, for you, pay the 5,000 and then the VAT will be within. Mm. You won't pay the taxes separately and say this is the item price and this is the VAT. So mm -hmm. the whole sum price you pay makes it indirect that for you, pay the 5,000 and then the other trader is going to separate what is VAT and what is theirs. Okay. Mm. So there's... Still, that one answers Shamran. There's one from Semambo, still from X, who's saying uh, who is funding the additional operational costs for data acquisition of the said gadgets, the power consumption, and even stuff for bigger businesses. Uh, that is in terms of uh, the gadgets. He's saying uh, who is funding the. So if I get an if uh -huh. the, 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 the fiscal. Mm, the fiscal device. Device. Mm. Then the 
maybe because uh, you said they have to charge it. it can last for 12 hours but i would have uh yeah. charged it which is electricity on that mm -hmm. um then maybe data to, yes. to be on internet mm -hmm. for the thing to work or for it to upload at the end of the day and maybe i'm getting um some accountants to help me or some cashiers here and there mm -hmm. to help me because of the tax yeah. maybe before i was managing on my own but now because okay. i have to do oh. use efforts i have to get these people who is funding that additional okay. cost additional cost okay or in other words how is it treated on our side okay yeah all right uh first of all uh even buying a gadget uh when you buy the efd machine it comes when it is also having a vat per uh, 18 percent mm. which you can claim in your business and then also the price which you incur, the charge which you incur when you're buying the fiscal device is claimable in your income tax. Mm. When you work out your profit margin, you mm. less off the expenses you incurred. And that gadget will be part of the expenses or purchases that you incurred in your business. So mm. you less it off. Mm. And then also the data expenses will also be allowable expenses in the income tax return. Mm. So all these will be less off before you compute, come to the 30% tax that you're going to pay. Okay. That means previously, if you're not using, if it's not incurring those expenses, that means you are giving URA almost the whole uh, margin that you made and you'll do 30%. But right now, you have to less off the expenses which you're adding, the additional expenses that you're incurring, and then you'll give us the balance of the net profit margin where we shall tax that. 30%. So all these come as the deductible expenses for the taxpayer that they don't, that they are allowed to deduct before they remit the corporation tax. Okay. Then, um, Kasire Peter, no, sorry, Sache Peter from mm -hmm. Facebook is thanking you for the glue, for the good clarifications that you've made. Okay. Then, um, Again, Achan, Brenda Nokolo is asking, how long does it take for URA officials to approve the amended returns? Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, Apuro. Uh, currently, the turnaround time, I can't tell you that actually it's a specific turnaround time, but uh, our officers are supposed to make sure that they re approve all these tasks within the SLS. Uh, that they are given, but if you have any delay in the approval of uh, an amended return or approval of a credit note, you can kindly follow up with your tax station to know why it has delayed or to uh, give any more explanation that is needed, maybe that has delayed the approval so that it's easily approved. But uh, currently, returns are approved when uh, an officer has clear information. So I suggest that if you see anything has delayed, kindly follow up with your tax station so that you find out why it has delayed and then you give any clarification needed and then this will be approved immediately. Okay. All right, thank you. So Farouk has clarified that after buying from a hardware, mm -hmm. that's when he found the investment team which asked for the receipt. But that we had already answered. Mm -hmm. Even though there's no tax on mm -hmm. the item you bought, mm -hmm. you should have the receipt Yes. that confirms that there's actually no tax on that item mm. and that proves the transaction and where I got it from. Mm. Um, the efforts team is not there to make life hard for you as a person who's buying. Mm. You can just show them and they'll take it up. If there's anything to take up, they'll take up the matter with whoever sold to you if they've not done the right thing. Mm. Uh, because it also helps you for people not to lie to you that there's tax on the whole when there's yes, actually no tax. Because mm, it also pays in case someone charges your tax, you're in position to dispute it. Yeah. And uh, they'll give you the correct invoice. So someone is saying, how can I send an invoice to EFRIS? Uh, that is in terms of invoicing. So I think this is in terms yeah. of invoicing and maybe, yeah. um, maybe Quizera, you can... Uh, clarify on what you mean. Would you like to issue an invoice using IFRIS? Or, I don't know. Mm. But I think that's what I you mean to ask. asking, how do you generate an IFRIS invoice? It's as if uh, generating an IFRIS invoice, even if you're not VAT registered and you're interested in if, uh, issuing an IFRIS invoice, you can go to the IFRIS site, which is uh, ifris.ura.go.ug 
mm. or go to the URS site and look for the IFRIS at the login section. Mm. Then uh, when you log in, you'll use your TIN and the password, and then you go under registration, and then you will select e-invoicing and the current date. That means the date of your registration should be the effective date. And then you'll be in position to issue an e-receipt if you're not VAT registered. So the information will be automatically transmitted to you once you generate that. That's, that's what I can uh, I think explain. Okay, but maybe we can also uh, next time organize a session where we go through how to issue these yeah. FRIS invoices since yeah. we are running out of time. Okay. Uh, we also have something from Nelly who is watching on Facebook and he's saying thanks for the good work done. I'm inquiring on how we file purchases from sellers without team under this new system. Okay. All right, uh, Nelly, I can demonstrate to you, I'd earlier pointed it out that mm -hmm. uh, there is a section that has been uh, added, which is called uh, out of scope purchases. I think I need to sub uh, submit, I suppose submit, let me, let me this time submit. All right, uh, when we go to our VAT return and uh, we check and uh, let's look at the match return. So I said click submit return since you want to add in something then you come to purchases when you come to the purchase schedule there is a section uh, that is out of scope this section here mm -hmm. i know that everyone can see it mm -hmm. uh, this section caters for any purchases that you made that was for uh, taxpayers that are, are not on ifris or suppliers and you can put it in any section either under pre-filled return or under this is for disputed so you put it under this box here that is under the pre-filled values but the last box mm. so i said that any purchases you income for tax purposes you have to declare the purchase so you put it under out of scope purchases mm. that is where we put our purchases made from people who are not on interest okay i hope that's clear for nelly nelly is also saying they are is also requesting for more clarification of withholding tax under the tax summary maybe mm, you can just review yes under the tax summary mm. all right so we said that under tax summary we had the vat here as one of the items then we had the vat withholding that is section is for people who are all taxpayers who have been uh, uh, selected as agents of URA to uh, collect VAT. Mm. So if you find that you're an agent, a VAT withholding agent, mm. then this section caters for that VAT that you withheld from your suppliers. Mm. And then VAT on imported services caters for any VAT that you did on the invoices that were under imported services. Okay. So this section is uh, this, uh, this normally these taxes separate different PRNs. If you have figures on each, each is paid separately. Mm. So meaning that when I submit my return, each of them is going to generate a PRN okay. because they are different. Okay. Then uh, if uh, for these other figures, I said that if you have credits that you know that they are not disputed, mm. you can select. Currently, we have a scenario where taxpayers have not yet cleaned up their ledgers. Mm. So because previous in the previous regime of the return, when you had an offset, you just come and put it in a box called offset, uh, brought forward, mm. and then it will reduce your tax. But all those offsets, we are not allocated to those periods. So they are still in the ledger and they are showing as if they are credits that are available for you to offset. Mm. But uh, what I would advise taxpayers is that you got your tax statement, which you ind indicated here. I can take you there. You're going to go to your tax statement. And uh, tax statement, I hope I've not rushed. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, when you've just logged in, there is something called your tax statement. And the report and uh, a below reports then when you click on it you're going to find that uh, your transaction your ledger is under tax position so you will submit 
So when you go and view here the first figure, you see, you see that someone is being demanded here 510 million, mm -hmm. but this might not be a correct position because they have not yet allocated their credits that they had on the ledger. So what you do, you have to click on the tax head, then you come down and see which which offset. So if you look at a, a, a line here of December 2021, mm. we have uh, this taxpayer has offset of 21, uh, 20 million. Mm. And then also here we have 27 million that has not yet been allocated to the other periods where they have liabilities. Where you see that you have positive, that means this is a liability. Mm. So you're supposed to move these credits and you, uh, help, uh, they help you settle these ones which are still outstanding. Okay. And how do you do that? You still come back here under your ledger and then you look for payment. Mm. Under payment, there is credit or balance transfer. Mm. And then under that, you would select uh, that you're looking for maybe VAT, that is the tax aid which has those credits. Then you will select the period where you have seen. When you look at your period, we've seen that in under December 2021, the mm. taxpayer had the credits. So let's go there and see how they will allocate those credits. Because it's a current pain. Someone asks for a TCC and then they tell them they are being demanded, but then they find they have oh, credits credit. that they didn't utilize. Mm. So when you go under this period, it is telling us that you have credits of 20 million that mm. are not utilized. Mm. So you can select any period where you have a liability with URL and say maybe January. And then you put in how much money you want to allocate under that period. And once you say click add, you can add as many periods as possible until this money is finished. And once you submit, this money is going to be uh, transferred from December 2021 to January, where you have an outstanding liability. So that is how you can help you uh, to clean up your ledger by allocating all the credits that are unallocated and take them to the periods where you have liabilities so that those liabilities are cleared by those credits. Okay. So that is how uh, the new uh, returns work. Okay, I think that yes. we've been able to clarify for Nelly. Okay. Um, and since we are now also, I think we've covered all the questions that were asked. Oh. Thank you all so much for um, sending in the questions. It shows that you've been with us and we encourage you to continue being with us. I don't know if you have any parting shots, especially mm. since this is the week, if I'm mm. not mistaken, when those returns are supposed to be, to be filed. filed. All right. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, our dear viewers, uh, we thank you so much for the time you've dedicated to listen to this uh, uh, program. Uh, the, we, as URA, we've come out to make sure that uh, we ease uh, the compliance by improving on first and the IFRIS, the very multiple uh, platforms mm -hmm. that are there to support you as taxpayers to issue invoices and ensure that uh, Ensure that you eliminate all these manual invoices because penalties come from all those manual invoices that you keep using besides with IFRS. Ensure that all the transactions you do are done through the system mm. so that you don't get penalties. And then also for the VAT returns, uh, all the VAT returns have been simplified and they are pre-filled returns that should not be late. By 15, you should have been able to submit that return so that it doesn't generate any penalties. And the preview return is there. You can run through it and see that it is very friendly. If you have anything you have not understood, you can visit any URA station and uh, get clarification or call our help numbers and the WhatsApp so that they clarify whatever figure you don't really agree with in your return so that you file the correct tax. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much for the submissions you have made and uh, we hope that uh, we've added value to you. All right, thank you. Okay, just, I know that we had kind of closed, but there's one thing from uh, Kashan Rahat, who's watching on YouTube, okay. who's saying, as per VAT Act, mm -hmm. at time of VAT registration, we can claim six months prior VAT, but we are also not seeing that option in auto field VAT return. Kindly advise on this. Uh, I think that's the one we've just illustrated last, right? Um, and that one is for newly VAT registered. I understand it. Eh? Okay, maybe you can. Okay. Uh, Farouk? Uh, currently, yes. Kashan. They, uh, Kashan. Kashan. Eh? Yeah. Kashan, they currently, the Act allows you to claim uh, 
all purchases uh, that is VAT incurred on uh, uh, purchases uh, six months before registration when you're just newly registered and in the new return if you want to have this option enabled kindly write to URA maybe through touch point you can raise the ticket through touch point so that they enable you to claim any purchases that are for the earlier periods and the act goes on to give you guidance that you can only claim VAT for stock that is still at hand. You can't claim VAT of stock that you had sold before VAT registration. That means the VAT you're trying to claim is for goods that you're going to sell under VAT because you have been registered, but you had not earlier claimed the VAT since you are still outside the VAT registration. So if you have uh, such a challenge, you can uh, raise the ticket. But uh, currently, I think uh, since the schedules are not provided for, uh, you can uh, work out the formulas and then put the workings onto the touch point when you're uploading your ticket. Then you submit it, showing which expenses you want to claim so that our technical team allow, uh, enables you to claim those expenses or purchases. So currently, it's, it's something that you have to really first notify us about so that they enable you to claim those things that are outside that period. Since you already have access to the apologies, you can illustrate how someone can get to touch uh, point. To touch point, all right. Yes. Um, uh, I'm going to demonstrate how to raise a ticket on touch point. Uh, yes. Okay, I'm going to use port here, portal. All right, uh, when you're a taxpayer and you're going to raise a ticket on touch point, if you've never registered before, you'll come under login. Then uh, under login, you look for touch point, which is the second last option. So when you click on it, it will bring you a window, which is called welcome to URA touch point. And then the URA touch point enables you to uh, raise any queries with URA and you can direct them and they will be properly answered. Currently, it is very effective and everyone strives to make sure they close their tickets. So if you're newly registered, uh, if uh, you're, you've never registered before, you come and click under register. Then you select whether you're a taxpayer and then you input your information and then click register. And then you'll be able to have an account and then you come back and log in. And when you log in into the ticket, it's going to be looking like this. So uh, you'll be required to go under create a ticket and then you'll find yourself uh, with this option of uh, uh, selecting what is the pain that you want to be addressed. Is it a return issue? So you'll select declaration stroke return. Then under support issue, you'll say uh, there is a filing of a return amendment, view return history, extension of return date, extension to amend return. And then uh, so for you, you'll put a uh, filing return. And then under filing return, you will put uh, maybe you need, uh, uh, you're making a follow up. You can select whether it is a follow up or a suggestion or a request. And then uh, you can put uh, the your team and the subject that you need to be allowed to claim for purchases outside, uh, which, which, which are six months before registration. And then you can put whatever information you want to, sub uh, to, to submit URA. Uh, you can explain here your issue and then for attachments you click on related attachments you select here and then you upload any attachment that you want to go with your information once you submit this it will come along with your ticket and then you'll be able to know how to address your issue so when you raise such a ticket it will be it will be directed by the system to whoever is in charge of this very item and then they will be able to assist you with the issue that you have. So once you submit your ticket, will be, it will be easier to follow up even if you just call customer care and uh, you want to follow up a ticket, you can use your, uh, your ticket number and then that person will be contacted immediately to close your ticket. All right, so thank you so much. I think... Uh, so one more from Candy. Um, oh, who's watching from YouTube who's saying, how do I follow up on we've held VAT by our customers? Um, I'm assuming it had a section, I remember, as well. Yeah, they, they withheld what? Maybe Candy can clarify if you're asking us if you can follow up on the system or if you check the system 
and you're not seeing them maybe you can ask about the credits all right uh candy had said that uh under the current uh tax uh tax statement there is a section for uh tax credits that are withheld by your suppliers normally it's the person whom you supply that withholds that vat so under this section when you go to this tax statement there is uh, something called whd credit and this section keeps track of any vat that has been withheld when you're under vat mm. is the one that tracks your vat when you're under income tax it tracks the income tax withheld the credits mm. so any credits that you don't see here you can kindly write to your supplier that you don't see the credits that they uh, subtracted that they deducted from you but then the other thing that you need to note is that uh, these credits are normally displayed at the end of the month mm. within the month they don't show but uh, we are trying to work around the clock to see how we can make them appear before the end of month okay. because uh, when someone remits a return like on 15th where are you part of the people who are withheld those credits can only be visible at the end of the month yet uh, you have to file your return before 15th so i think that's the pain that she's saying but those credits will later be displayed and you can be able to claim them at a, at a later date but they will be able to cross over at the end of the month that's when they they are displayed in your tax statement okay so i think you had given you closing remarks yeah i don't imagine you want to close again <laughs> It's just to encourage taxpayers to be compliant mm. so that they avoid unnecessary. Taxpayers really come to Boulevard there mm. and they are telling us that the penalties, you have given me like penalties of 18 million, those are three penalties of 66 million. Mm. And the person doesn't even have that profit. When they look at the profit they make, they don't have that 18 million. Mm. And yet it has come as penalties, mm. which were avoidable. So I would encourage taxpayers to really desist from issuing non-fiscalized invoices mm. that can lead to unnecessary penalties because they eat into your margin. Penalties mm. cannot be claimed even in income tax. When it comes to penalties, it cannot be claimed as an expense mm. because the, the income tax disallows any penalties or fines. So meaning that these penalties are just going to eat you into your capital and you will never get them back. So I encourage you all, don't say that this item is not vertable, this was is uh, outside, like just make sure that everything that you sell goes through IFRIS so that you avoid all those unnecessary penalties that will eat into your capital. Right. So personally, I'll thank everyone who has joined us. Uh, it has been engaging, even telling from the questions that we have received. And we encourage you to keep coming. And if you phoned, because when you are going through the touch point, it felt a little bit lengthy. You can also just text us on uh, the different platforms. You can DM us on X, on Facebook, TikTok, um, YouTube. Because the same way you've asked the questions, we are able to pick them up and answer them. There's also a WhatsApp number. There's a toll-free line. So you can tell us that airtime is a problem. Just pick up your phone and dial those numbers that are running through the screen right now as you watch and we shall be able to assist you. Um, I will close by some by sharing some interesting statements that I'm seeing on X, where someone is asking URA to explain EFRIS in football terms. And here they've said that EFRIS is VAR for VAT. Meaning, again, as someone is saying, brother URA, explain it like a ghetto youth or a ghetto youth. And here they're saying that Ephris came here to ensure that nobody cheats VAT. So basically, um, it's better for you to just be compliant. If you do the right yeah. thing, you won't have any penalties, you won't have any issues, and everyone will be okay. It's when you want to evade that Ephris becomes an issue. But if the issue is that you don't understand or you need help with learning how to file the return on how to calculate we are here for you just approach us through any of the platforms and we'll be there to support you um from first to and i have a good day and thank you for joining us